Hi, we are at the exhibition Shadow Circus today. Uh, it was supposed to be a live session, but due to technical issues, we are doing a recorded conversation now. Uh, we are at IIC in New Delhi. Uh, this exhibition is one of textual and visual archival material with uh, a diverse array of material of photographs, uh, maps, uh, letters, journal entries, film and video work. Uh, this has been put together by filmmakers and artists Ritu Sarin and Tenzin Sonam, who are also the custodians of this archive. Uh, and Natasha Jinwala has been uh, uh, instrumental in curating this project as well. Um, this, is, uh, this chronicles a lesser known uh, moment of Tibetan resistance from the Cold War world. And um, uh, we are here with uh, Ritu and Tenzin now, and we'll uh, ask them, we'll hear from them a little bit about the political context, uh, the social context of this uh, moment, and then also their personal uh, sort of how the how how this kind of uh, political moments affect people's personal lives because we are looking at a personal family archive. Uh, hi, Tenzin. Hi. Um, nice. Thanks for being here with us. And if you could tell us a little bit about the context of this exhibition, this time period, this couple of decades that we, this more or less covers, and what's happening in this period, and the sort of the beginning of the Tibetan resistance as you see it, experience it yourself. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So uh, a lot of people don't uh, know that uh, Tibetans uh, took up arms and you know, fought the Chinese when the Chinese first invaded and occupied Tibet in the 50s. I think especially today, uh, people tend to see Tibetans as primarily non-violent, compassionate, you know, uh, peace-loving people, which of course, uh, by and large, we are. But uh, that kind of negates the fact that uh, there was a time in history when Tibetans did take up arms in the defense of their country. And uh, this happened in the mid-50s, in around uh, 1956, 57, when uh, Tibetans, primarily in Eastern Tibet, took up arms against the Chinese after the communists started imposing reforms uh, uh, you know, in their, in their uh, areas. And that uh, revolt then spread to central Tibet where uh, a very wealthy uh, trader called Andu Gompotashi, he started an underground resistance movement, first based in Lhasa and then eventually shifted to the south of uh, Tibet in 1958 uh, called the Chushi Kamdu, which uh, translates as four rivers and uh, six ranges. And uh, so uh, during this period, uh, when, the, when the Tibetans were fighting the Chinese in, uh, inside Tibet, Andu Gompatashi, the leader of the resistance, uh, then sent some men to India uh, seeking support, seeking assistance for the resistance. And uh, they, these men went to Kalimpong which is a border town uh, you know, with Tibet, of the, the, the primary kind of trading post between Tibet and India. And there they met uh, the Dalai Lama's elder brother, Gyalutundu, who was already based in uh, exile as an emigre, having uh, escaped from China and uh, having recognized that the Chinese kind of designs on Tibet were uh, far from peaceful or you know, sort of uh, generous. And the CIA at that point had already been in touch with Galutindu and when the people from Tibet, the emissaries of uh, Andu Gopatashi, came to him seeking help, he put the two together and that's how the CIA's involvement in the Tibetan resistance began uh, sometime in 1956. Uh, so this chapter of uh, in our recent Tibetan kind of history is uh, often overlooked and uh, even today nearly 60 or 70 years uh, after the fact, uh, you know, it's not just uh, the international community, but it's also Tibetans uh, uh, who are quite unaware of the details of this movement. Now, uh, as, uh, as uh, Shinjuti mentioned earlier, this is a personal archive. It's the archive of my father, uh, Lamut Sirin, who uh, was a key figure in the resistance and the primary kind of liaison between the CIA and the resistance. And during his time with the resistance, he maintained extensive uh, records of, 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 of the operations that he was involved in, which uh, included photographs, you know, documents, maps, uh, letters, anything he thought would be important to uh, record this uh, chapter for uh, posterity. 
and uh, as it so happened, uh, he did end up writing uh, an eight-volume account of the resistance based on uh, the archives that he had saved. He passed away in 1999, and the archives then came into our custody. Meanwhile, Ritu and me had already uh, been researching uh, the story inspired by my father uh, for a film that we eventually ended up making for the BBC called The Shadow Circus, the CIA in Tibet. And during the making of this film, as part of the research, we encountered a lot of former American CIA agents who had worked with Tibetans and Tibetan resistance fighters. And we did extensive video interviews uh, with them. Um, what this exhibition is, is uh, a, a kind of a, conflate, a conflation of uh, my father's archives and the material that uh, we gathered and presenting it in a context, in a situation that kind of maybe makes sense uh, to an audience today, uh, partly to remind them to, uh, you know, to pay uh, homage to the people who sacrificed their lives at that period, and partly to open up the discussion again about the status of Tibet, how it, uh, how what's happening in Tibet today under Chinese uh, control affects uh, the geopolitics of the neighboring area. Primarily, of course, uh, India and China. Thank you so much for that, Tanzin. And uh, I was wondering, this is a really wonderful exhibition of diverse material, but I was wondering if you could look at these three paintings there, that uh, these quite incredible paintings. So basically, as Tanzin said, uh, the Dara Lama's elder brother introduced the CIA to the Tibetan resistance. And this is how this chapter kind of, you know, moves forward. Uh, I should mention that the, apart from the people at the top, the Tibetans were not aware that it was the CIA. For them, America had come to their rescue. You know, when they were studying uh, later on, uh, you know, they had Eisenhower's picture behind them. So for them, it was America was coming to their support, and nobody else had come to their support. Only America had come to their support. So, you know, it was a... Um, they were very, very happy, and they had a great deal of hope for where this was going to go, and they thought this was going to save Tibet and free them from China. Uh, what we don't know, uh, did they, what they didn't know was, of course, the CIA was involved, and the CIA had the kind of history where they left after some years, and that all CIA, the CIA was trying to do was be, uh, you know, give China a hard time. It was a communist country, and everywhere they could, they just wanted to be a nuisance to the Chinese, and so that was very different points of view they were coming from. Um, so the first part was uh, training. The CIA took about 250 people, uh, Tibetan resistance fighters, uh, to a place called Camp Hale, which was in the Colorado mountains. And over here they trained the Tibetans to be guerrillas. And part of their training was also like art lessons. And I think the idea was uh, it was also for understanding their psycholog psychology. So it was like a kind of understanding of the psychology. And these are some paintings that came out of that uh, period. And uh, they were actually in the homes of the CI officers, because the CI officers, of course, saw them and liked them so much that they had them in their possession. And later on, they passed them on and donated them to a museum. But uh, that's where these paintings come from. Um, before I go on, I should mention that, of course, the archive has Tenzing's father's personal voice uh, there, but also Tenzing's, and it comes in the form of these three uh, uh, blue uh, panels, and this is really Tenzing's story, how he experienced, uh, experienced, you know, growing up, you know, as a child of a, a person who was uh, the head of the Tibetan resistance, you know, one of the chief officers of the Tibetan resistance and of course it meant he wasn't the father wasn't present when he was born he had no idea where he was and he only found out when he was 15 years old when he saw a bulletin board in the school that his father had been taken to prison and only then he found out that his father was a, a resistance fighter so you know it tells his kind of personal story um, and if you come in here um, these are images from Camp Hale uh, it was high up in the Rocky Mountains, and the Tibetans liked it so much uh, that they called it Dumra, um, the garden. And the relationship that the Tibetans um, had with their instructors was generally very positive. They liked each other. Uh, the Americans saw them as really good students, very, very genuine, ready to give up their lives. 
and uh, the Tibetans liked them as well because they found them very like enthusiastic and so they got along rather well which was a surprise for us when we started making the film to find what a good relationship the two groups of people had and these are some of the uh, cartoons and drawings that have again come out of uh, their art lessons and these were of course propaganda tools and were sent in uh, you know, later on to China and uh, uh, in India. And all of these cartoons and propaganda material was part of the Lama Sering archives? Like, yes, this, this is, is all part of his archives. This archive. is, of course, like other, many others, he was also collecting everybody else's art and... Uh, no, so it's, it's, no, it's mixed. So some of this material actually was in the possession of the CIA uh, officers and then they have either passed it on to us or given it to a library. So I think actually none of this was in his possession. This is all okay. part of our research. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's very mixed up. And through this show you see that we have sort of six monitors of interviews and these interviews are in three sections and they came out of our work uh, when we made the film. And uh, it's like this first one is all about their training program. The second set of uh, monitors is about uh, the para dropping. And the third set is about uh, Mastam. Yes, yeah, so what you're seeing here is uh, our pages from uh, quite a remarkable uh, book that we found in possession of my father. Uh, actually, while he was alive, we uh, never saw it. Yeah, we, only, we only discovered it after he passed away. And it's basically a, a notebook of about 350 pages, hardbound. And uh, almost every single page is filled with uh, these beautifully illustrated and handwritten, um, you know, uh, instructions. Uh, it's it's like a manual of guerrilla warfare. Um, obviously, it's what uh, they were trained uh, uh, at Camp Hale by the CIA, and uh, they faithfully transmitted that uh, in in this book. So uh, here, the handbook drawings uh, uh, show you. Uh, Four, uh, six stages of uh, uh, you know jumping out of a plane in a parachute. Now, what the CIA did after they trained these people, especially in the early years, was uh, to send them on missions uh, inside Tibet. Uh, I think there were a total of about eight missions they sent these uh, men in. And during these missions, uh, each of the men who were sent on these missions were given a cyanide capsule. Uh, this was to you know give them a way to end their own lives if uh, they felt that they were going to be captured by the Chinese, if they so desired. And uh, the cyanide capsule was strapped to their wrist. Uh, many of them actually ended up taking their cyanide capsules and uh, dying. Uh, one such person survived uh, his mission, was arrested by the Chinese, spent 20 years in prison, and then uh, you know, escaped into exile, and then lived in Dharamsala for the rest of his life. And uh, this is a little, uh, he, 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 he talks about uh, how the people in his group took their cyanide capsules. Uh, another person who had been uh, trained in Camp Hale uh, and been parachuted into Tibet and made it out had, his, uh, had saved his uh, cyanide capsule. So many years later when we uh, were interviewing this guy and we were asking him about the cyanide capsule, he said, well, I still have mine. You know? And uh, so he took it out and we photographed it. Uh, it doesn't look like anything, uh, or, or like anything you'd imagine a cyanide capsule to be. Maybe it's shriveled, you know, up over the years, but uh, yeah, it's a funny story. And, and also about these drawings, I wanted to ask, uh, they are not, these are from uh, Lamo Sering's journal. That's right. But uh, they're drawn by various different people, or That's is right. it all him? Oh, no, no, no. So uh, uh, this, these are not actually uh, uh, from a journal as such. Okay. They are a handbook of uh, guerrilla okay. warfare, okay. which were drawn and written by uh, other people. Okay. Uh, but okay. they happened, to, uh, my father happened to save them. Okay. So I don't okay. know if there was uh, more than one copy of this or okay. whether this is the only copy that they made and maybe they photocopied or, hmm. you know, or in those days, I don't know what they did. Copy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sort of uh, disseminated it. But this is the person right here that you see whose story we have here, who took the cyanide capsule and survived. His name is uh, Busan. And he lived in McLeod Grant for a long time. Um, and over here, you can see him here, and he's a yellow man. That's him. Yeah, a very 
He has a very tragic story. And here on these panels, you see um, all the people who were para dropped into Tibet as part of this mission, most of whom died probably from taking the cyanide capsule. Uh, very few of them survived. And the black boxes are for the people where we don't have a photograph. If you also wanted to tell us a little bit about your own film. Yeah, so yeah. we made, we actually started researching this subject together, Tenzing and me, in um, the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made this film, I think, finally 10 years later. Um, and it was made for, for, at the time for BBC, but it also showed in many other places on television. Uh, it was a 50 minute film, and at the time we made it, it was, had to be dubbed because it was on BBC One and BBC One required you to have a dubbed film. Uh, we have now re-edited this film and it's no longer dubbed. Everybody is speaking in their original voices, but it's still the same length. So it's a different version of the film. We've made some changes to it. And so this is playing here all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. and I think it's a kind of important to yeah. understanding whatever happened at that time. Yeah. And here we have these maps. And these are the first maps that we believe were ever made, uh, detailed maps of the Tibetan Plateau, and it was made by the CIA. Um, at that time, we had the, um, the U2, U2, supply the U2 supply planes, and so they really mapped Tibet very well, and everything, all the villages and places have been marked in Tibetan, so a lot of work went, to it, went into it. And these were originally made on silk, and they were given to the people when they were para dropped or when they went on radio missions. So they had a whole lot of them made. And they were used uh, by, by all the operatives at that time. And we have one map over there in a vitrine, one original map, and the rest of them are here with us. Um, so yeah, they did a lot of work on many different levels uh, to make this happen. And here are the books of Tenzin's father. We have the eight editions of uh, in Tibetan of the Tibetan, uh, the story of the Tibetan resistance. Along with a lot of research materials, if you have time to see, we have actually just left research material that we found. Uh, when we made the film, a lot of material was not declassified, but in the last 20 years, a lot of material has now come into the public domain, so we have been collecting that, and some of it's on display here. So, uh, as Gitu mentioned earlier, uh, part of the exhibition has uh, a personal kind of voice, and uh, that's uh, my voice, kind of uh, trying to uh, weave the larger story through my own uh, uh, narrative. And uh, here, for instance, uh, I talk about how I was 15 years old uh, and in boarding school in Darjeeling, when uh, one day I, you know, we used to have the daily newspaper pinned on our uh, bulletin board and I suddenly saw this small uh, article that said something like you know Tibetan rebel leader arrested in Nepal and when I read that article it mentioned uh, my father's name uh, my father has an unusual name for a uh, Tibetan so I was like is that my father but uh, what's he doing in Nepal and what is this you know about Tibetan rebels um, as far as I knew up until that point he was uh, working for the Tibetan government in exile in Dharamsala or in uh, Delhi and we were living in Darjeeling so the whole thing came as a complete shock to me but uh, a few days later my uh, mother came to visit me uh, at school and she explained that yes uh, your father has been arrested but uh, you know and he uh, worked for the resistance and right now there's this problem in Nepal where the Nepalese army has cracked down on the resistance and your father unfortunately was caught in the middle so there's nothing for you to feel uh, you know sad about or ashamed about because you know it's he was he's been arrested for a good cause so she told me all those things and uh, part of my father's uh, role as the liaison between the cia and the resistance was to meet with uh, his cia counterpart um, regularly i think i believe almost once a month he would make the trip from uh, darjeeling to calcutta in the early days, the CIA uh, operatives uh, were based in Calcutta. And uh, they would, uh, you know, it was very cloak and dagger. My father would have to uh, have a newspaper under his arm. He'd have to wait outside a particular restaurant uh, on Park Street. Uh, 
a car would pull up and you know uh, open the door and he'd get in and there the CIA people would be and they'd drive around and they'd exchange you know information documents money instructions whatever then at the end of that they'd drop him back uh, on the side of the road and he'd go back to Darjeeling so uh, yeah that was kind of uh, very interesting you know to hear these stories uh, some of the things he collected are these uh, letters that uh, we have here which are letters written to him by his CIA uh, counterpart and uh, what's so interesting about these letters is uh, you know how mundane the art of espionage and uh, spycraft can be because it's really you know I mean it's the CIA but it's really about uh, accounting and money it's you know sort of saying where are the bills for what I sent you the money you know I need the receipts uh, you know it was at that level that uh, some of the uh, operation was uh, working at. So, uh, this is in Mustang. This yeah. is in Mustang, okay. and after 1959, uh, you know, when uh, the Dalai Lama escaped to India and the Chinese took full control of Tibet, the resistance uh, inside Tibet also retreated to India. And uh, Andu Gompotashi, the leader of the resistance, he came to Darjeeling and immediately made plans to uh, restart uh, a fresh base of operations for the resistance uh, in Nepal, in an area of Nepal called Mustang, which uh, is an area that's very similar to Tibet politically and culturally and also very remote. And uh, so he and the Dalai Lama's elder brother, Gelat Hindu, they drew up plans for this new uh, base of operations and uh, asked the CIA if they would support it. The CIA did agree to support it, and this new base was uh, then built uh, or established uh, in Mustang. Uh, these are all images from uh, Mustang. This uh, image of the light box, for instance, uh, is one of a uh, few photos that my father had in his collection that actually records uh, a raid made by uh, the guerrillas from Mustang into Tibet where they're confronting uh, uh, Chinese soldiers. Is it your father who's taking most of these pictures or are there mm. other photo pho photographers also? No, in fact, uh, my father... Uh, he was not involved in taking the pictures, okay. although he was at Mustang, okay. in Mustang. The photographs were taken by uh, others uh, who okay. were also trained to, uh, you know, trained to take trained pictures. To take right. pictures. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are there accounts of who did what kind of jobs in this kind of? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. there's no breakdown of uh, who, Names like, you or mean, like, like who individuals. were photographers, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, sadly not. Mm -hmm. But we have recently found more papers that belong to Tenzing's father, so perhaps mm -hmm. we'll find more information, more information. Yeah. once we're able to go One of it. the early photographers of the Mustang uh, resistance and uh, uh, somebody who went inside Tibet in 1958 and filmed the resistance in Tibet was actually my own cousin, uh, my first cousin, mm -hmm. and uh, he was trained uh, in Darjeeling uh, to uh, you know, take photos and operate a movie camera and yeah. sent to Tibet first and then sent to Mustang as well. So mm. many of the early photos from Mustang were probably uh, shot by him. So we have some actual archival footage of uh, Mustang and we have it over here on this tablet and over there on that screen. And this is uh, footage taken by uh, other people. This was taken by a Tibetan who had been trained in uh, uh, camera work and so they've shot their daily life and what they did and kind of like the origin story and behind you there is some more footage of some Mustang taken by uh, another individual so we have two refugee uh, you know records archival films from that era um, and here we have objects uh, that went Tenzing's father's possession um, including a camera that's pretty much looks like the one on that wallpaper and I think this is the kind of CIA issue camera of the time. And behind, below that is the original silk map that similar to the maps you've seen earlier but this is the original. 
Annie. So, Sorry, I want to just show yeah. the. Please, uh, that's the. That's actually Fenzing's cousin that he mentioned with the camera. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that. You see him there with the camera. So, he's probably one of the major photographers. Uh, so, very quickly, we come here to the end of the resistance, uh, which happened in 1974. Uh, so prior to that, in 1970, the Americans suddenly pulled out of uh, uh, supporting the Tibetans. And that had to do with the fact that they were reaching out to China and talks were under underway you know, uh, for rapprochement with uh, the Chinese government. And basically their support of the Tibetan uh, resistance was proven to be an impediment uh, in those talks. So they suddenly announced that they were going to pull out. The resistance kind of limped on for another four years until 1974 when the Nepalese government, then acting under pressure from China, uh, sent an army to Mustang and demanded the surrender of the guerrillas. Now this was a very uh, tricky time. My father was in uh, Okra at the time. He was arrested by the Nepalese army, used as a bargaining chip in uh, the discussions. But the guerrillas decided they were not going to surrender. And it was at this time of very uh, high tension that the Dalai Lama then intervened and sent uh, a tape recorded message uh, in which he asked the guerrillas to lay down their arms. And uh, we actually uh, managed to get the original tape uh, of that recording and it's playing here, uh, you know, where he kind of uh, very gently and in great detail explains why they should surrender, you know, why this was the time for them to surrender. So the guerrillas did surrender and uh, you know, that, that was the end of Tibet's armed struggle. And uh, we end uh, the, the exhibition on a more personal book. And uh, that is uh, to kind of hark back to my father's own origins as somebody who came from a very remote kind of borderland of uh, Tibet, the far northeastern corner of Tibet, near the monastery of Kumbum, which is uh, what you see there. And, uh, yeah, if you uh, go down to the next photo, then uh, you see his father and his brothers. That's his father. And uh, I mean, you can see they're real kind of frontier people. They're like Silk Road people. And this was a part of Tibet that even when my father was a child, uh, was already like uh, swamped by uh, Chinese uh, settlers. And Tibetans, they were like, you know, already sort of clinging on to their cultural identity. So it's really remarkable uh, when uh, I think about it and you know, when Ritu and I re-look at my father's story that somebody who came from such a remote borderland part of Tibet would end up then becoming so kind of key to a national struggle and uh, devote his entire life really, his entire adult life uh, towards that cause, uh, you know, towards the cause of an independent uh, Tibet. So, so that's, uh, we end this on that note. And uh, just before we finish here, in 1995, uh, Ritu and I went back to, went to Tibet for the first time. And uh, before we went, we asked my father uh, if he could draw us a map of his village, uh, if he remembered what his village was like, because he had last seen his village in the 1940s. So it was almost 50 years uh, since he had left his village. And he kind of drew this very detailed map and explained everything to us, which uh, Ritu recorded uh, on video as well. And uh, so, yeah, it's remarkable how one's longing for one's homeland uh, remains so strong. And we did make a film uh, about this journey of ours called A Stranger in My Native Land. We're not showing it here, uh, but it is available for people to see. Thank you so much. Uh, Ritu and Tenjing for showing us through uh, such an incredible exhibition. Um, uh, th and thank you, uh, our audience, for watching us. And we will be back with more, uh, with other, going through other exhibitions in this, during this period of the art fair. Yeah, thank you. It's only going to May 1st on it Sunday. Is, yes, it is only around till May 1st. That is another two days. Another two days. Yes. Yeah. So you must come and see it soon.